Welcome back. The denouement of the 1605 novel evolves out of the ambivalent discussion between the canon and Don Quixote about the importance of romances of chivalry. In closing, Cervantes offers us three final stories, each with allegorical connotations. The Adventure of the Knight of the Lake, narrated by Don Quixote, the story of Leandra and Vicente de la Roca, told by the goat herd Eugenio, and the battle between Don Quixote and the penitents carrying a statue of the Virgin Mary. At the beginning of chapter 50, Don Quixote makes his last statement in the debate with the canon, repeating almost word for word the innkeeper's defense of the books of chivalry. These books, which are printed at the license of kings and the approval of those who sanction them, and which are read with general amusement and celebrated by the old and the young, by the poor and the rich, by the learned and the ignorant, by commoners and nobles. Could they all be lies? Notice the existentialist irony of the phrase, which lies in the fact that Don Quixote describes the same bureaucratic process that approved the very book of which he is the protagonist. Moreover, the objections of our Hidalgo and the innkeeper undermine the censorship endorsed by the priest and the canon because they reveal that government regulators are inevitably biased. Don Quixote now gives us an intricate final summary of the chivalric fantasy. The adventure of the knight of the lake is comparable to the one he tells Sancho in chapter 22, except that this is an example of catabasis, or descensus ad inferos, that is, a voyage into the underworld. Another unique aspect of the story is that Don Quixote uses the first person plural to more intimately include his audience and readers in the experience. Can there be any greater pleasure than seeing as if we were to behold here and now before us a great lake of boiling and bubbling pitch? Note also that we learn of the presence of the protagonist of this story only indirectly, thanks to a quote within the story. From the middle of the lake, there comes a sad voice, which says, you, knight, whosoever you are, who gazes upon this fearful lake, if you want to gain the good that lies concealed below these black waters, unveil the valor of your triumphant breast and hurl yourself into the middle of this black and burning liquid. The mysterious voice tells us that beneath this blackness, negrura, the lake hides a wondrous world containing the seven castles of the seven sprites. This reads like an allegorical version of a voyage to Mikomikon, the African kingdom that requires Don Quixote's presence to save its princess. It also reminds us of the geographical trajectory of the captive who crossed the Mediterranean and descended into the baths of Algiers in order to rescue Thoraida and bring her back to Spain as Mary. Moreover, in an ironic and contrastive way, the adventure of the lake alludes to what Thoraida's father actually did when he learned of his daughter's conversion to Christianity. The knight has scarcely finished hearing the fearful voice when, without making any mental calculations, without taking any account of the risk to himself, without even shedding the weight of his tremendous armor, entrusting himself to God and to his beloved, he throws himself straight into the boiling lake. So the conclusion of the 1605 novel opens with a symbolic baptism. The adventure of the night of the lake symbolically gathers together all the figurative falls of the caballeros who had to hit bottom, so to speak, in the Sierra Morena, Grisostomo, Cardenio, Don Quixote, Don Fernando, Anselmo, and Perez de Viedma. Furthermore, the strange world in which the hero finds himself combines the novel's multiple pleasant places, from the green meadows with streams in the Sierra Morena to the typical fantasies of classical and medieval knights, such as when Don Quixote cites the classical Elysian fields inhabited by heroic and virtuous souls after death. There are even here allusions to the Islamic paradise. Don Quixote repeats that the knight is welcomed by a great number of maidens, and we note a deference to Islam in Don Quixote's typical terminological vacillations for their palace. 
yonder there suddenly appears an impregnable castillo, or a sumptuous alcázar. The description of the paradise that lies within the lake is also a kind of artistic manifesto, a remarkable vision of the Baroque aesthetic. The tiny mussel shells and the spiraled white and yellow abodes of snails embedded about with deliberate disorder. But it's more than this. The paradoxical deliberate disorder suggests the hybrid world of the Mediterranean. There's even a touch of mysticism, both Muslim and Judeo-Christian, in the untrained melody of the tiny, countless, and multicolored birds which flit about among the intricate branches. But hold on, Petrarchism, in other words, courtly love for a single woman, dissolves the exotic chaos of the scene. Notice, for example, how right when Don Quixote again hesitates between Muslim and Christian architecture, a woman stands out from among the many maidens. She, who seemed to be the first among all of them, steps forward to take by the hand the bold knight who had hurled himself into the boiling lake and guides him without speaking a word into the rich palace, Alcazar, or castle, Castillo, and strips him as naked as when his mother bore him. 